Good afternoon, and welcome to the NIEHS Partnerships for Environmental Public Health web seminar titled Examining and Communicating the Health Implications of Arsenic in Our Food System. I'm Beth Anderson. I'm a program analyst for the Superfund Research Program at NIEHS. I'm also a um, member of participant in the PEPH program. So, um, I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. Today we have two presenters, Dr. Margaret Carragas and Ms. Larry Rardin. The first presentation will be given by Dr. Carragas. Um, Professor Carragas is the director of the Children's Environmental Health and Disease Prevention Research Center at Dartmouth and the project leader on the Dartmouth Superfund Research Program. She received her PhD in epidemiology from the University of Washington, after which she joined the Dartmouth faculty, where she heads the section of biostatistics and epidemiology. Her work encompasses interdisciplinary studies designed to illuminate the pathogenesis of human disease beginning in early life and impacting health throughout lifespan. So, Margaret, I'll turn it over to you. Ready to go? <laughs> I'm just going to show the screen here. Okay, can everyone see the screen here? So I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the collaborative work we've been doing at Dartmouth on early life exposures stemming from our Superfund research program where we've been looking at uh, drinking water exposure to arsenic and then extending with our new children's center to look at dietary factors. And I recently presented some of these data at the annual Children's Center meeting, so those of you who attended that meeting, uh, this talk will sound a bit familiar. So there are documented early effects of arsenic in experimental systems relating arsenic exposure to congenital anomalies, including neural tube defects, abrogated growth, and infant mortality and data from highly exposed populations to drinking water arsenic suggest effects on fetal and neonatal mortality, spontaneous abortion, and stillbirth, as well as low birth weight and prematurity, infection, and cognitive decline in children. Arsenic can cross the placenta such that concentrations in maternal blood parallel those found in cord blood, and this was illustrated in a study of Andean women exposed to high uh, 200 microgram per liter arsenic in drinking water, where it can be seen that their mother's blood arsenic concentrations were on average 11 microgram per liter, which is similar to what's seen in the infant cord blood, which was around 9 microgram per liter. And placenta tissue itself the placenta regulates nutrient flow into the fetus, also contains arsenic. The drinking water standards for arsenic have declined over time as our knowledge of the health effects of arsenic in the general population have grown. So in 2001, the U.S. lowered the standard to 10 microgram per liter, with some states having gone even lower based on the NRC recommendation, such as New Jersey. However, it's important to recognize that private wells that serve less than 25 individuals or less than 15 households are not regulated. This presents a problem for rural states like ours in New Hampshire where a significant proportion of the population relies on private, unregulated drinking water systems. So when we designed our pregnancy cohort, we decided to focus on pregnant women who use private water systems. Our study is focusing on the New Hampshire population, and we're including a region that has, where we have found in our previous epidemiologic work, had wells that were above 50 microgram and up to 800 microgram per liter. And the concentrations over 50 are shown as the large red dots, and the orange dots show where the levels are above the current standard of 10 microgram per liter. And indeed, what we're finding is 
about 15% of women in our study have a household tap water that exceeds the current MCL of 10 microgram per liter. So this is a cause for concern. For most people who don't have high arsenic concentrations in their drinking water, diet is the main exposure route. And currently there are no statutory limits for arsenic content in foods sold in the U.S. or the EU. In China, the limit is 0.15 microgram per gram. And I participated in a European Food Safety Authority Committee a few years ago, and based on an extensive review of food arsenic values across Europe, review of the epidemiologic literature, and a detailed risk assessment, we concluded that dietary exposure to arsenic should be reduced. Rice is a staple food worldwide, and it's also one of the major dietary sources of arsenic. And this is a synchrotron image of a rice grain generated by my colleague Tracy Punchin here at Dartmouth, and showing in red is arsenic as it's entering the rice grain through the ovular vascular trace. Available data suggest that the arsenic loves levels in rice are highest among U.S. rice, and this is shown by the black bars here. But you can also see that there's very wide geographic variability in arsenic content of rice worldwide. And this variability is in part due to paddy field biochemistry, rice physiology, including the genetics of the rice cultivar. And one potential source of the arsenic is soil residues of arsenical pesticide uh, from old cotton fields where rice is now grown. One biomarker for arsenic exposure we use in our study is urine. Urine is a short-term biomarker that reflects exposure within the past few days. Um, this more elaborate pathway <laughs> is shown on the left, the metabolic pathway for arsenic. And I'm going to focus on this more simplistic model here. So arsenic undergoes reduction from arsenic-3 or arsenate to arsenite. I mean arsenite to arsenate, which is arsenic-5. And then it's monomethylated and then dimethylated. So arsenic-5 and arsenic-3 are referred to as inorganic arsenic and monomethyl arsenic and dimethyl arsenic are referred to as organic forms. Now this is distinct from arsenic that's found in fish, uh, which is an organic arsenic that's essentially unmetabolized called arsenobetane. And obviously this is distinct from organic food, meaning food grown without pesticides. And the reason I mention this is that there's been confusion by the media and others on the various forms of arsenic. To look at sources of arsenic exposure in pregnancy, we used information from mothers and their medical records to derive variables such as age, smoking, and gestational age. And in addition to a urine sample, we asked them to collect a, a water sample from just their kitchen tap and then to complete a three-day water, seafood, and rice intake diary. The samples were analyzed by ICPMS. The water samples were analyzed in Brian Jackson's lab at Dartmouth, and the urine samples at the University of Arizona Superfund. What we found was that roughly one-third of the women in our study reported eating rice and those who ate rice reported eating about a half a cup a day. And the concentrations of each of the arsenic fractions were higher in rice eaters than non-rice eaters. You can see that for each of the fractions, including inorganic arsenic, and these were all statistically significant. We also fit general linear models to the data. So what we did was we took the amount of tap water women reported that they consumed and multiplied it by the arsenic concentration that we measured in their tap water. And then we, 
we modeled rice intake alone as a food item without assuming any specific arsenic concentration. Because as I showed you, arsenic concentrations vary so widely, there was no one individual value we could assign to the rice. Urinary arsenic was our primary outcome measure, and which excludes arsenobetane, so a sum of all the other species. And then we adjusted for maternal age and creatinine concentration, which adjusts for urinary dilution, which is fairly conventional. And I think also noteworthy is we have very low detection limits for our assay. So for each of the fractions, we have about 0.1 to 0.15 microgram per liter detection limits. So what we found was that arsenic intake from drinking water was associated with increasing arsenic concentrations. This is the line here. And this is fully expected. And we've seen this before in other populations. But the new finding was that rice consumption was independently associated with urinary arsenic concentrations after adjusting for arsenic intake from water. So based on our model, eating about half a cup of rice per day equated to drinking one liter of 10 microgram per liter arsenic in water. And we published these findings a few months ago in PNAS. The, a postdoc who's now a professor here, Diane Gilbert Diamond, is the first author with the shared first authorship with Dr. Kathy Cottingham. And Dr. Cottingham, along with Dr. Punchin and Jackson, are leading a project um, in our children's center looking at infant and toddler exposure to arsenic with concern both about infants getting arsenic through the drinking water from the wells and as well um, arsenic through rice products. And her project is also investigating various biomarkers of arsenic exposure in infants and toddlers. In an initial market basket study, levels get fairly high in some formulas and over the current MCL of 10 microgram per liter, particularly in those formulas containing brown rice syrup. And this is potentially worrisome for young children if, if they rely on this kind of formula as their primary source of nutrition. And the results motivate us certainly to look further into this and to study the biomarker concentrations in the infants, as we are now doing. And Lori Reardon is going to speak much more about the messaging. But let me just mention a few limitations of our work so far. Our analysis of individuals' arsenic exposure from rice, um, we did not actually test the rice itself, nor did we know what brand it was or the country of origin of the rice. And it's very likely that we didn't fully account for all sources of rice, such as rice fillers and sweeteners, which we're doing a much better job with in our kids' studies. In our analysis of the infant and toddler formula, we don't have the actual infant exposure levels, such as biomarkers in urine. Um, and in any case, we need to better understand the health impacts of food sources of arsenic exposure, which is the focus of our ongoing work. So in conclusion, that we find that in our study population of pregnant women, drinking water arsenic from private wells related to urinary arsenic excretion. And that rice alone, without accounting for arsenic content of rice, was associated with urinary arsenic concentrations in pregnant women. So if we're thinking about reducing exposure, we'll need to consider multiple exposure routes. Um, we also need to think carefully about our messaging, which is what Lori's going to talk about. Um, we obviously know that people who have a private well, especially those in susceptible subgroups like pregnant women and kids, need to have their well tested for arsenic in our region. And this is a focus of our community engagement activities. And then we need to think very carefully about making nutritional recommendations 
And we don't want to repeat some of the same mistakes we've made with mercury, where pregnant women stop eating fish due to fears of mercury contamination, yet fish has nutritional benefits. So I will stop here acknowledging a vibrant group of collaborators and creative thinkers that I have the honor to work with. In bold are some of the authors that were, are on the papers that I've discussed here. I want to thank the NIEHS and the EPA and everyone in the audience. Um, thank you very much, Margaret. So we'll take a, a few minutes to have some questions for Margaret. Um, so one of the, the first question that I received or we received is, should I be concerned if I eat a half a cup of rice once a week? Okay, so I wonder, Beth, if we should wait until after Lori's presentation, which is going to talk more about messaging to people to take these questions. What do you think? Certainly, that one can, we can, I, I was kind of wondering about that too. Um, but um, maybe, and the other questions, um, and you can tell me if you think this is better addressed after your presentation, Laurie, is what is known about arsenic and rice cereals designed for infants? Yeah, so those are both really good questions. Um, I'm happy to either address them now or wait till after Laurie's presentation. I think um, I can just say briefly that what we're the messaging that we're getting from this work that we're doing now is just to highlight the wide variability there is in arsenic content of various rices. So we're, the work is encompassing rice products very generally, and we're going to be testing more products through our work and through the work that Dr. Cottingham and others are doing now. So. Our point, I think, of the papers is to alert people that there is arsenic in rice and that this is something that we need to regulate. You know, as I mentioned, right now the U.S. and Europe really doesn't have a statutory limit for arsenic in food. And so this is something that we feel needs to get changed. But again, we don't want to send the wrong message because rice is a nutritious food. Um, we just need to be able to monitor the amount of arsenic that's in our food. So it comes down to more of a regulatory issue than it does an individual level issue. OK. Um, thank you, Margaret. And like you said, maybe we should, based on the nature of the questions that we have, we should wait until um, after Lori's presentation. And um, then the two of you can kind of answer the questions <laughs> together. Um, so with that, I'll, we'll go ahead and like to introduce Larry Rardin, who's worked in the environmental communications field for over 20 years. She was an environmental studies major at Connecticut College and received her MES from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies with a concentration in environmental communications. And, um, her experiences have given her a keen understanding of the need to create two-way dialogue between researchers and end users to ensure that research questions and the results are used to benefit public health and the environment. So over the past several years, as a research translation coordinator with the Dartmouth Toxic Metal Superfund Research Program, Ms. Rardin has faced many exciting challenges in communicating some late-breaking news regarding arsenic. Um, and so I believe that's some of which is what she's going to be sharing with us now. So, um, Lori, I'll turn it over for your presentation. I'm happy to be here starting uh, to continue on with part two of the presentation and glad to be talking with a lot of you that I think I saw at the PEPH biannual meeting so we can continue some of the conversation that we started. So we'll be talking about perspectives on complexities of communicating the emerging science on arsenic and food. Okay. So um, 
I am the research translation coordinator for our Dartmouth Toxic Metal Superfund Research Program. And we have an interdisciplinary program. Um, this is just an illustration of the way our projects fit together. And we're supported by um, our Trace Elements Analysis Core run by Brian Jackson and our Integrative Biology Core run by Jason Moore. And we have the uh, three biomedical projects looking at um, arsenic and their effects on hu its effects on effect on human health. Margaret does the epidemiological birth cohort work. Um, and we have the two non-biomedical projects, one looking at mercury and one looking at arsenic and rice. And those have been moving forward and working together um, very in a way to complement one another. And the research translation comes in to make sure that the research results are getting out to our stakeholders and to end users who can make use of that information. And um, in terms of the work we've done on arsenic and rice, it's been clear that we have a risk communication um, message that needs to get out and a, somewhat of a challenge. And just as Beth alluded to, with all of the papers that we have had published recently, um, and a lot of the national media, uh, it's really brought everything kind of out in the open, and I'm going to talk a little more about that. Quickly, I just wanted to back us up a bit. A very simple explanation of risk from our one of our government partners, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, one of their drinking water fact sheets. Risk is a result of an exposure to a hazard, and they want you to be sure or want the public to understand there must be a source of risk and an exposure to the hazard. And they go on to talk about the fact that it's possible even though there is a source of risk, you might not necessarily ever be exposed to that risk. In the case of exposures in food, there are additional factors to consider, though. That is, that the source of exposure has benefits as well as risks. There may not be any knowledge of the contaminant uh, in the exposure source, the food, and the potential for the level of exposure varies widely depending on a variety of factors such as age, weight, frequency of consumption, and the amount consumed by the individual. Some background information on risk communication. Many of you out there may be very familiar with this, but um, when we think about communicating risks, we have to think about perception of risk. The public perceives risk differently. And Paul Slovic and Fishoff, um, some of the experts in this field, uh, Fishoff has identified that risks that are familiar, voluntary, natural, or under our control are not as, a, as much of a concern to people as risks that are considered exotic, unfamiliar, or involuntary. And another part of risk perception is also the fact that nowadays there's so much information out there on everything, as well as our science continues to develop. There's, we can look at things um, at lower and lower levels in terms of analyzing the levels of contaminants and the effects those are having on human health. So there's a lot of information for the public to process. And this book that I have, um, the cover on the right side of the slide, I just found something I think I will be reading soon, a practical guide for deciding what's really safe and what's really dangerous in the world around you. But that's part of what we're trying to do is help people make those decisions. Risk communication is defined in very broad terms by Lundgren and McMakin into care communication, consensus communication, and crisis communication. And I won't go through those. I've given a little squib as to how they're defining those. But I think where we are is care communication with the arsenic and food issue. There's uh, a danger and a management that's determined by our research. A good example is smoking. We were able to 
definitively tell people that smoking was an extreme hazard to your health, and by doing so, we're uh, working on protecting human health. So in our program, our science has been maturing, especially regarding science relating to arsenic in food, and in our case, rice. And we began a market basket pilot project through the Superfund Research Program. And that, as well as the pilot project work being done by the Children's Environmental Health Center, has contributed to the three papers mentioned here. And the, one, the first paper is the one that Margaret was describing earlier in her talk in more detail. And then the third paper is the one I'll discuss a little more, which um, has received the, most, the largest amount of publicity. So as our science is maturing, and just when we thought the public was understanding that brown rice was um, better for you and organic food was good for you because of being grown without pesticides, then we're, we move into a new area when Dr. Oz kind of cracks the issue open for us. We, we knew we had to get the word out, but he sort of helped lay some of that groundwork. And I'm, after this presentation, I'm curious to see whether you think the Dr. Oz and the Consumer Reports media um, publicity helped the situation or made it more difficult. So if you want to vote, you can let me know by email after words. Um, you don't have to tell me during the questions and answers, but I'm just, it's something I'm wondering about, um, and it certainly opened everything up. So uh, there was Dr. Oz, September 13th, which there was a lot of controversy between Dr. Oz and the FDA. Then Consumer Reports came out with a very thorough investigative report covering arsenic and juice, as well as rice and water. Um, the PNAS paper that Margaret mentioned came out on December 5th, and that received a lot of media attention. But on February 16th, the paper led by Brian Jackson, Arsenic Organic Foods and Brown Rice Syrup, was uh, released through, it's published in HP online right now in the online format, and it'll be published um, in their journal in May, but it um, received 23,000 hits to the EHP website within the first week of its release. It generated about 50 media news stories, multiple news reports, including major networks, a story on NPR. Brian Jackson received at least 300 emails from concerned individuals. Numerous emails were received by co-authors for the paper, as well as others in our program. Now I'm going to switch gears on you. We'll come back to this story and how we handled it and what we learned from it. But as a way of thinking about framing our message, especially when we're talking about emerging science, where we don't have all the answers, I'm going to give you something to think about. So I drive up and down the highway from Concord, New Hampshire to Hanover on a regular basis, and I pass these LED message boards along the highway. And they flash a variety of messages. Um, one recent one was about the weather. So the first flash was extreme weather advisory. The next one was snow, sleet, freezing rain. The third, reduce speed to 45, stay off the roads. So that's a risk message in a nutshell. It's very clear. They presented the problem, they gave information about the problem, and they gave us an action. So if I had been smart, when I saw that message, I would have gone home, done my workout, and lay down on the couch. But if you think about a message like that for arsenic and food, what would you say on one of those LED boards that was flashing along the highway? Would you say arsenic might be in your cereal? Because the information about the problem, because we know there's arsenic in rice and your food is made, maybe made with rice products, but we aren't sure whether how much of that is organic or inorganic, et cetera. There's still a lot of unknowns. 
And what is the action that we tell them to take? Drop the bowl of cereal, don't eat it. We can't say that because that wouldn't be responsible because of the issue of nutrition of these food products. So it's important that we think in terms of how to communicate with the public. What do they need to know and how do they think? And again, back to the risk perception issue. When a scientist thinks about communicating information, I love this illustration in it. I first saw it at the PEPH meeting. Ed Kang had it um, up in his communications session. Um, anyway, the background, scientists give the background first. Then they end up with their results and conclusions. The public needs the bottom line first, the so what. And then supporting details are fine. With emerging science that we're dealing with surrounding contaminants in food, we have to consider those risks and the benefits. And we have to realize that we're dealing with a lot of gray area. So we have a responsibility to present our research. We need to get the information out. But we also have to be prepared to answer difficult questions and try our best to think about what are the effects, what actions should I take, what do we know, and what don't we know. Additionally, when we have this kind of emerging science, especially around a food-related issue, we have to think about how we're going to release our results. Typically, we might have our press office in our college or university help us issue a press release. If we know that there's a potential for a media flash, as I'm calling it, um, we have to think about how is the press release written. It's going to, if it's a press person, a press office, they're going to want to get publicity for the college. They're going to write it with a certain type of hook to draw the media in. That might give it an angle we don't necessarily want, so you need to think about that. As again, it's a food issue, we have to convey the benefits as well as the risks. And we have to, as Margaret mentioned, we have to be careful about making recommendations that could change an important dietary requirement for an individual. So here are some lessons we've learned. Prepare ahead. What you know, think about what you know, what you don't know, what you're trying to find out. People will respond if you tell them what you're trying to discover. What are you researching? What are the questions you're trying to answer? Keep your messages clear and simple. Now time your release. This was a big lesson that we learned. If you're going to embargo your paper, you need to pick a date that works for your program, for your whole program, because everyone might end up needing to be in response mode. If you have more than one spokesperson, make sure you are all using the same message. And think about notifying practitioners in the area who might be receiving calls for information. We had our regional PACE, our Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit in Boston, receiving calls about arsenic in toddler formula and other rice-based products. We also found out at the PEPH meeting that the PACE out in um, the West Coast was receiving calls, too. So think about that. Important, too, to think about what kind of numerical information is going out. Um, is it using different types of measurements, like parts per billion or micrograms per liter? Is that going to make sense to the media and or to the people reading that information, say, in a news article? Will they know how to interpret these numbers? Is there a way for them to gauge the risk from these numbers and put it in perspective? Is there a way you can give them some kind of illustration to help them understand what the numbers mean? And is there a possibility that that numerical information could be skewed? We did have that happen. Um, some of the numbers that were used in the arsenic and organic brown rice syrup paper um, were skewed by the media and may blown up in a way they shouldn't have been. So what did we do, getting back to our story? We ended up putting up a, an FAQ response onto our website, on our home page. We um, evaluated the emails that we were receiving and went, kind of came up with the top 
six or so questions and put together simple responses to those questions. So it's important to think about before you go out with your message what kind of background information you'll want to have available. Keep it clear and simple. And consider talking to local communities to get a sense of the types of information that would be helpful to them. Perhaps put together some focus groups. It was clear from the emails that we received that people were very grateful for this information. And it's important that researchers remain objected, objective and trusted resources. Um, it, that's essential, especially today, with the glut of information from all kinds of sources that may or may not be reliable. Scientists and researchers need to keep that trust. So a good way to do that is to maintain dialogue with your stakeholders, with your end users, with the public. So the end of our story for now, we're continuing our work, as Margaret mentioned. But on February 17th, the FDA put up on its website a statement on arsenic and organic in brown rice syrup stating that beginning in October, they began a further study of arsenic in rice and rice products to determine level and types of arsenic found. And the study is due to be completed spring 2012. So in my opinion, one objective has been met, which is we've started a dialogue on setting standards for arsenic in food. So now maybe we can consider moving on to the consensus communication level um, category in terms of continuing looking at how we are framing these messages regarding arsenic in food. So with that, I want to thank folks in the Superfund Research Program, the Children's Environmental Health and Disease Prevention Center, the Office of Public Affairs, through the college. Uh, they really did a great job helping us, as well as some folks from uh, other SRP programs and Ed Kang at NIEHS. So I can happy to answer questions now with Margaret. Thank you very much, Lori. That was um, really appreciate your presentation. I want to thank um, both you and Margaret. Um, you gave us a good idea of, of the recent advances in arsenic and food, and the, also on how you approach communicating this information. Um, certainly, it's a hot topic that's a lot that's in, been in the news, and um, I think. Um, you also appreciate you sharing us some important lessons that you've learned. So again, I'll remind people to enter your questions into the question box. Um, and I'm, we've got a few, so I'm going to um, go ahead with the first question. I'll let you and um, Lori and Margaret figure out who, who wants to respond. So did you send your paper to the MFR of the baby formula or notify them of your study prior to publishing? The uh, Margaret, to I, the don't believe, I, don't, I don't believe so. Margaret, I don't think that happened, correct? What does the acronym stand for again? Manufacturer. Oh, <laughs> the manufacturer. Um, That is a question that Brian Jackson, I, do you know, we need him on the line. <laughs> He's really well, we can, we'll check in with him for a, a definitive response, but um, to my knowledge, no, but I can follow up and be sure that's the correct answer. Okay, thank you. So another question, was there mention of long grain rice of, uh, as having the most arsenic? Um, are these results true for short grain rice as well? That may be another question that we would have to check with Brian uh, on in terms of um, 
specificity, but in terms of these products, I don't think that we have a way of knowing whether they used long or short grain rice. Say, for example, the organic brown rice syrup, I don't know that we can we have that information from the manufacturer as to the exact types of rice they're using. Um, and again, I could confirm that with Brian, but does that sound right, Margaret, to you? Right. I mean, in our study of pregnant women, we did not ask them, at least initially, until we started looking at our data, um, what type of rice specifically they were eating and what brand it was or what country it was from. So we didn't have a lot of detail about the types of rice they were eating. We're collecting that now that we see these results. So um, those are all issues that need to get explored. And OK, thank you. Um, so I, again, we get the question if we get a copy, uh, can we get a copy of the slides? And do we, we generally do, um, we do make um, them available if, if possible. Um, so Justin, do you have a comment on that? Are you prepared for that? Are you? Um, we are not prepared at this moment, but if you would like to email me um, at uh, Crane J2 at nihs.nih.gov or Liam or the PPH webinar or the PPH email address, which we'll show later. Um, I will be happy to get you those slides when they are available. Okay. Um, the next question is How do you convey to people that some of the arsenic in the comparison a half a cup rice equals one liter of? 10 parts per billion is coming from the water used to cook it. The water may be the controlling term. Right. So in that, in those computations, we assumed that there was no arsenic in the drinking water. So it's a conservative estimate. So it's not, we're assuming that the water arsenic is zero. I think that's the question. OK, thank you. Um, kind of um, along the similar lines is the, the 10 parts per billion MCL for arsenic in drinking water is set as a level that is feasible. Does, it does not have any relationship to the actual level of dietary arsenic that presents an unreasonable or reasonable risk to public health. Is there any evidence in your research that actually that actually determines? And I just kind of lost the question here. Um, is there any evidence in your research that actually determines the level of dietary arsenic that may present an unreasonable risk to public health? So that's a really important question and one that we're addressing in our research right now. So that was one of the third bullet points I put in the limitations of our research right now. What we're presenting here is some preliminary evidence that arsenic is found in certain foods in the formulas, and specifically that I mentioned for infants and toddlers um, in the toddler formula that had the brown rice syrup. And then in our pregnancy cohort, we're really, it's a really an exposure biomarker study. We have yet to look at the health consequences downstream of those exposures, but that's something that we're investigating moving forward. So neither or any of the research that we presented today relate arsenic ingestion from rice to a health outcome. Is that clear? OK. Um, then another question is, rice milk is a great alternative for children with allergies. Um, do you have any suggestions of what could be an alternative? Um, 
Is that a question for me? Well, yes, Barbara. <laughs> I can okay. take it if you want, but go ahead. Well, I mean, again, what I mentioned before is that really we're not making any dietary recommendations in this research. We're just alerting. Um, really, we're trying to inform regulatory agencies. And like what Lori said is the FDA did respond and say that they are going to be following up on the brown rice syrup issue. So that's our goal. Lori, did you want to add anything? Nope, that's about what I was going to say as well. OK, I have another question. Have any food manufacturers or retail food companies, especially health food stores, contacted you? Yes. <laughs> um, and again, we have, we certainly would have more we could provide more details once we check back with Brian, because he has all that um, information. And most people were contacting him directly. But um, yes, we have been in touch um, to a point. And um, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't had any direct contact with the manufacturers. Um, another question is, as a pediatrician, how should I respond to parents who are deeply concerned that they have irreversibly harmed their children by feeding them other brown rice syrup products and who are insistent upon a biomarker testing that, in my opinion, does not inform prognosis or treatment decisions. Well, I would, Margaret, um, you can back me up here. I'm not sure whether we could answer you definitively, except that the information that Margaret presented indicated that um, arsenic does not remain in your system. Um, it is excreted after a couple of days. So uh, my understanding is, unlike mercury, it doesn't bioaccumulate. And while there is definitely a different set of factors for a baby or a child as compared to an adult, um, you know, th that's the thing. The science is still emerging. There's still many unknowns. Um, and as a pediatrician, or from me to you as a pediatrician, I couldn't tell you what to do. Um, but I would just, I think it's important that people understand that it doesn't build up in the system. And it's, as for an adult anyway, it tends to be a long-term exposure issue. Well, I think this is a really good question and one that we really have to work on to present to the pediatric community and the clinical community. So these results are fairly new. Um, it's not, I mean, actually measuring a child um, is not a recommendation that we've been making. Again, I think, you know, really what our research is trying to alert um, regulatory bodies is the presence of this contaminant in food and that we need to monitor our food to understand what is in our food. So I think that's the main message that we're trying to relay here at this juncture. I think one additional point, though, to make would be that it's important. I mean, you want to allay your patient's fears, but at the same time, you could also mention to them that it's it's important to think about total arsenic exposure. So if they were potentially on a private well, they would need to think that would be an opportunity to say, well, you, have you tested your well? Um, because you want to be exposed to the least amount of arsenic as possible. Um, that's clear. So 
that's important to think about as well. That is for sure, and that I mentioned in my presentation, that that is the message that actually we tried to get out when the first PNAS paper came out, that that's something we know. If you have a private well, you should have it tested. So that really is a clear message. I completely agree with Lori, and that's the message we tried to convey although the media wasn't as excited about that message as they were the other issue. We've got um, a couple of more questions and just a few more minutes, so I'm going to try to get in maybe one, one more question. Um, I think, um, how are you able to determine that arsenic and rice is from former agricultural land use and not naturally occurring in soil? Uh, I don't think that's anything, I'm not sure that we have determined that. Uh, we just know that it is a factor that is combined with the naturally occurring arsenic that's in the soil uh, and from water that's used, say, to irrigate rice fields that may contain arsenic that could come from natural sources or from pesticides. But what we do know is that a lot of rice is grown in fields that were used to grow cotton, uh, particularly in the southern regions of the U.S., and that there was an arsenical-based pesticide used to control the boll weevil on those cotton fields, and that there is residue remaining in the soil from that use. And we know that rice takes up arsenic, as you may all know now, but um, that's, you know, something particular to the rice plant, that it takes up the arsenic, uh, thinking that it is silica. Um, so it's very specific to rice. Okay, well, thank you. Um, this, um, your presentation's generated a lot of interest, and we have a few more questions, and we'll um, try to get take care of those um, after the call and get get responses um, on these other two. I do want to um, add um, one message that we got um, that says, keep up the good work. This is exactly the type of science-based public health research that is needed to get the policy makers to act in today's anti-regulation political environment. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe I should just have stopped with keep up the good work. <laughs> this is exactly the type of science that we need. So um, I do want to thank you both um, uh, for, for really fine and interesting presentations. And so before we close, I want to make a few announcements to everyone. Um, we want to know, do you have the tools and resources that you would, do you have tools and resources that you would like to share regarding communities, researchers, healthcare, public health professionals? Please consider sharing them with the PEPH community by submitting them to the Resource Center. And you can, um, hope you all know how to do this. You email them to peph at niehs.nih.gov. Um, and then we want you to keep in touch with the PEPH listserv. So um, stay in touch with us. Um, I want to mention that the next PEPH webinar is going to be Mapping and Environmental Public Health, Visualizing Health Disparities and the Effects of Pollution. It's scheduled for May 7th, and you can register already, so I, um, you um, register on um, go.usa.gov slash IIT. Is that up on the slide now? Oh, <laughs> well, you can see it on the slide there. But um, I encourage you to go ahead and register. That's available now, and that's going to be presented um, by our colleagues at Columbia, Meredith Golden, Alexander Van Heen and um, Stephen Shilrud. So then I want to encourage you also to, after today's seminar, take a moment to fill out our short 
webinar evaluation form. Your feedback is really important to helping us ensure that we're providing you with the high quality speakers and information that you can use. And if you have any news that you want to share, um, please use the PEPH newsletter, the e-news announcement. And, you, um, and if you're not receiving it, you can sign up um, at P, again at PEPH at NIEHS.NIEH.gov. So um, our time is up. I want to once again thank um, Dr. Margaret Carragas and Ms. Lori Rarden. And that concludes our webinar for today. Bye.